A lot to learn out of this. In Proverbs chapter 10, I want to tell y'all this morning, right quick, like, this is a very simple lesson about how to be poor, okay? I know that there's a lot of people in this world that have money and they have houses and they got cars and clothes and food and stuff like that. That ain't for everybody, okay? I know that there's some people that would rather just have nothing, okay? They would rather be poor and broke and stressed and have, you know, lots of calls from people collecting money and things like that. They want to be popular. I want to tell you how to be poor today, okay? It's guaranteed. This is straight out of the Bible, and it's very sarcastic, okay? Okay? It's very sarcastic. I'm, I'm, it's got some jest to it by me saying how to be poor. Y'all know how to be poor, right? Don't have money. That's how you be poor. But do you know that poverty, as mentioned in the Bible, is so much more than just not having money? Poverty and poorness is a way of living. It is a standard that some people maintain their whole lives. And quite simply, if you don't want anything, if you don't want any responsibility, if you don't want any possessions, if you don't want any of that stuff, just don't work, right? And you can just not have anything. If you want something, anything worth having, you got to work for it. Anything worth having, a marriage, uh, a house, it's going to be work if it's worth you having it, right? I mean, marriage ain't easy, raising kids ain't easy, working a job ain't easy, maintaining uh, your sanity ain't easy. It's very easy to just throw in the towel, to give up, or say, I'm tired. And they just be poor from then on. But folks, God don't want us to be poor. God wants us to, to not be poor. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to have. He wants us to, to not live in this, this life of want, but instead to live a, a life that is satisfied by Him meeting our needs. Look at Him in verse number 1. Let's get into that. Um, I'm running off a of coffee. There was an eggshell in my McMuffin, and I didn't need it because it was too crunchy, and I didn't want to crunch on that eggshell again. So it's extra coffee day. Are y'all ready? All right, Proverbs 10, verse 1. A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mama. Do y'all know why he wrote that this way? Because mamas are proud regardless, right? <laughs> you got to do something pretty special for your daddy to say I'm proud of you though, right? Am I lying? No, I'm not. I'm being honest. So, a wise son will bring joy to his father, but a foolish son brings grief to his mama. You want to upset mama? Act a fool where she's got to make an excuse for you or lie for you or something else because you are not very smart. And that will bring grief to your mama. Listen, if you do something so bad that your mama can't defend you, that's pretty bad. Because I know that mamas can make a lot of excuses, right? Amen? Amen? Ain't nothing wrong with my baby. My baby's perfect. My baby walked on water. Uh-huh. My baby's all that. And a bag of chips. And some Fritos. My baby, my baby, my baby. And the daddy's like, you're going to have to do something for me to say something good. And the mama's just waiting to say something good. Mm -hmm. That's right. I wonder if anybody's ever bragged about their baby's the ugliest baby. I mean, it's still bragging, right? I know my baby's ugly, but it's the ugliest one ever. That's still bragging, right? All right, never mind, never mind, never mind. Verse number two. Ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but He thwarts the craving of the wicked. Lazy hands make a man poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. He who gathers crops in summer is a wise son, but he who sleeps during harvest is a disgraceful son. Blessings crown the head of the righteous, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. The memory of the righteous will be a blessing, but the name of the wicked will rot. Verse number 8, 
The wise in heart accepts commands, but a chattering fool comes to ruin. The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. He who winks maliciously, y'all, the Bible says don't wink. So stop it. Okay? He who winks maliciously causes grief. Y'all, that's just lying, right? Ain't it? That's all he's talking about here. You know, when you tell a lie and then you wink, that don't make it not a lie. That just means you let somebody know that you lied. Now they in on the lie. Now you have what's called an accomplice. Okay? So when you tell a lie and then you wink at somebody, that's not cool. And according to the Bible, don't wink maliciously. Don't be winking at nobody maliciously. Look, if you're looking at a what? You're looking at a girl and you're like, hey baby, and you wink at her, that's malicious. Right? Just don't do that. Alright? Because she may take that as he likes me like a lot. And you might have just had something in your eye. So you just let them know why I ain't no winker. Because my Bible tells me not to. There's you some witness and power. He who winks maliciously causes grief. And a chattering fool comes to ruin again. That's the second time he done said something about a chattering fool. Verse number 11, and this is where we're going to stop at today. The mouth of a righteous, of the righteous, is a fountain of life. But violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. Do you see here Solomon in writing this? He is contrasting through every verse, good and bad. Throughout the first 11 verses, that's what he's talking about. You have somebody that is doing good, and then somebody that is doing bad. Somebody that's doing positive, somebody that's doing negative. Knowing the value of good hard work, that is something that it seems as though the world is, 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 is lacking today. Have y'all noticed how people seem to be determined to only do what is necessary to get by? Right? And <clears throat> I remember when I was growing up, that, that neighborly love, that being a good Samaritan was a real deal. It was something that people taught. They was like, you've got to be this way, right? you got to be this way. Now, the Bible uses a word here. I want to make sure that we all understand what this word means. And the word is diligence. Okay. Now, this word diligence, when you look it up, y'all have probably used this word in this sense. Um, When you go to shop for a car, you need to do your due diligence. right? That means you need to check it out and make sure that the price is about right. Make sure that the car is working. I mean, you can buy a car online, but... Ain't that a risk? See, common sense tells you to go check it out. Kick the tires, listen to it run, drive it around. Do your due diligence so that you know that you're making a wise purchase. I mean, look, if I call up Jim and he's got a car for sale, he's going to tell me everything that he thinks I should know about it. But all good stuff, right? That's right. I mean, you ain't going to sell something and be like, hey, I appreciate you coming by. Yeah, this is a lemon right here. (laughs) This thing ain't no good. Billy Reed couldn't say this one. I'm just telling you. This one's bad. Uh, That'll be a thousand. Uh, What what say ye? I mean, we can do it old school. And and I would be like, yeah, ye says no. I don't want that because it's, it's not good. I did my diligence. I know what it is. You ever go... Go horse shopping as you do. You got to go check them horses out, right? And they say if you look a gift horse in the mouth, there's something else that went along with that. I can't remember right now. <laughs> but apparently, if you look in their mouth, you'll see that their teeth are long and that they're really old. And so, when a tooth or when a horse is long in the tooth, that means he's really old because they don't have birth certificates or licenses. So you don't really know how old they are. I mean, a horse could just walk up and be like, "Hey, I'm three. You know, not written. No, you ain't. 
You're at least five or six. Look at you, the way you get that sway back, you know. That's an old horse trying to pass for three. You know you done had a 500-pound person on you. Look at your back. You're all wore out. You do your diligence, you know if you're getting a good horse or not. Diligence means that you are investigating, you're checking, you're doing whatever is necessary to make sure that you're doing it up to a standard. So with diligence, when we change our attitude and we start having diligence in our attitude, then we are the second mile Christian that God and the Bible is trying to teach us to be. Where if somebody needs some help, not only do we help them, but we go the extra mile with them. That's what it means by being a second mile Christian. You know where it says turn the other cheek and all that stuff? It's like give more than is expected. That's what diligence can bring you. Because when you get to a place in your life, I know when you get older, it's like it naturally happens because God made us that way, right? When I was young, I was impetuous. Um, I was very um, impatient. And if I was going to do something, I would just go and do it. Just rush right into it without thinking a lot, right? And that would get you in trouble from time to time because that's not wisdom. <clears throat> when you get older, I don't know about you ladies, but men, tell me if this is right. When you get older, you just start picking at stuff, don't you? You can't just accept something at face value anymore. Now you've got to investigate. Is that, and that just happened, right? Once you got to be about 30, 40, all of a sudden you just started being able to work on stuff. All of a sudden, life started like, let me just investigate. Let me piddle. Let me meddle. Let me work on it. Let me, you know, get involved. Look, ladies, most of the time we don't have any idea what we're doing. I'm being honest, okay? This is insight. But look, it, it's ain't like y'all know either, but we pretend like we do. Because God made us that way. And, and we will. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, we, we develop diligence. Where we don't just buy a lawnmower and cut our grass. Now we're working on the thing. We're taking blades off and sharpening them. We're changing the oil in the machine. We're doing things that we would have never known to do before. But now we have diligence. Now we're going that extra step. We're doing what's necessary in order to get the job done. And most of the time, we don't know what we're doing. We don't. We don't. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. Y'all, I, I got up under my daddy's house going to plumb something. I had no idea what was going on. I went to a Home Depot three or four times. I was like, I can't find a pipe that fits. They had changed the whole style of pipe. It was a whole different brand. It was something called CPVC. Well, y'all didn't even got to put a C in front of it just to confuse people. What is wrong with y'all? See, my diligence was lacking because I had not done my due diligence in studying plumbing before I got to messing with plumbing. If you want to be poor, never develop diligence. It's a guaranteed recipe for poorness and poverty. If you don't want to have, keep taking the easy way out. That is guaranteed to make sure that you will never have anything. If you always take the easy way out. And that seems to be the standard nowadays. Doesn't it, Kelly? People doing just the minimum, just to get by. Don't want to do too much, right? When's the last time you did something for somebody and it surprised them? Hmm? I mean, like, you surprised them by doing more than they expected you to do. Do you remember what that feels like? That is diligence in action. Verse number four. Let's focus on this one just a minute. Verse number four. Lazy hands make a man poor. They make for poverty. Diligent hands bring wealth. 
Diligent hands are hands that are doing what is necessary to get the job done. Diligence is something that means that you are steady, you are steadfast, you're unwavering, you are, you are energetic, you are putting some effort forward. You are involved. I like that. And with diligence, we, we also have um, another thing that is required. Diligence might make you, might be a work ethic, but there also must be integrity involved. Integrity is, will you tell the truth even if nobody knows? That's integrity. That's when you do the right thing even if nobody knows about it. That's having high character. That's having a standard in life that God expects from His children. Look, when we were born... God let us be be born into this world where we are right now at this time. You lived your life. You had your family. You had your opportunity to come to know Him. At some point along the way, you realized what sin was. Sin was that thing that separated you from God. Sin was that thing that made you feel guilty and convicted and, and feel bad. Sin is bad. I shouldn't do sin. I'm a sinner. I need to do something about that. You felt that in your heart. And it's like, God, I need to do something about this sin. So what did God do? He knew that you were going to need to be saved from that sin so that you didn't have to pay for it. So He sent His Son down here to die. And He died on the cross. That cruel, indominious death that He died for me so that I could live a life that matters, that counts. I don't think Jesus died the death He died so that we could just have mediocre existences. You know, my Jesus was great. So I think that we can be great Christians. I think that the Holy Spirit of God is the most powerful entity known to man. I think that God's Holy Spirit here on this earth is more powerful than any nuclear bomb because that is the thing that can change a soul. The Holy Spirit can speak to you and bring you to repentance where you turn away from sin and you choose eternal life in God. Okay. You've been saved. The Bible also tells us what to do next. How to work. How to do. Now we do know that you are saved by grace, not of work so that any man can boast. You can't earn your way to heaven. But we do know that faith without works is dead. We know that when the Holy Spirit gets inside a human being, they become diligent. They get integrity. They become truthful. They become trustworthy. And when a, a child of God, in the hands of God, look at these 11 passages of Scripture right here. This, the child of God is the first line. You know, he, he's the line that's doing good. Look at every one of these verses. I can relate to every single one of them doing things the wrong way. Because y'all, that's how I used to do everything. Right? Before you had a standard, before you had God, your, your, your standards were probably not lined up with God's. So you would take shortcuts. Or you would do things the easier way. God put a standard in your heart. This is, this is about not just money, but I think the, the, the richest I've ever felt had nothing to do with a bank account, but it had everything to do with the amount of Holy Spirit in my soul. When, when I get anointed by the Holy Spirit, when I, when I get full up on the Holy Ghost, I, I, I can't feel no richer than that. I can't. You can't feel no richer than that. I mean, knowing that you have peace with God, knowing that you're not going to hell, knowing that your Creator is, is pleased with you, there's no feeling like that. There is no feeling like that. So what happens is that once you get saved and the Holy Spirit comes and He lives inside of you, now He has brought with Him spiritual gifts, 
a spiritual um, nature, and now you're able to start seeing things from God's point of view. Wisdom has entered into your being, and now, okay, I want to do more. I want to go to extra step. I want to proclaim my Jesus for the world to see. And when you serve somebody else and you go that extra mile, everybody knows why. Just don't nobody act like that no more. Except for Christian. It's easy to spot a real Christian nowadays. Isn't it? Because folks, church, nowadays, Diligence and integrity are just, they're not at the forefront. It's more about convenience. There was a man who took a pastor position at this church, and next door to the church lived a man that was an alcoholic. This man drank every single day sat on his porch, stared at the church, and drank. Preacher went and visited this man when he first moved into the neighborhood. And the man told him, I'm never coming to that church. There's been some things going on I didn't like. I'm never going to that church. I'm never going to a church. Whatever. And he sat on on the porch and he drank his beer. Every Sunday after church, the preacher made a beeline for that dude's front porch. And he sat there with him. And the man didn't mind the preacher sitting on his porch talking to him. So every Sunday the preacher would go over to his house, sit on his front porch, and preach the same sermon that he just got done preaching. And that man heard more sermons sitting on his front porch than he ever would have heard. Probably going to a church. (laughs) Because it was one-on-one on on the front porch, you know. Hey, you want me to come to your house and preach to you one-on-one? We can work that out. It'd be weird. I promise. (laughs) Because <laughs> if you don't get my joke, then that's just you. <laughs> and I will stare at you till you laugh. <laughs> Said it took him 10 years. 10 years. That man finally came to church. That was diligence. That was doing whatever it took. Can you imagine? what churches would be like if all of the members had that amount of diligence, that go gettedness you know, that I cannot accept less than because my God told me to expect more. You know? Why would you settle for less than God wants to give you? Why would you? Do you say that God wants to bless you? God wants to make you feel rich. He wants you to feel like there is nothing in in the world that you need. You have it all. When you got Jesus, you got everything. And that is what has caused you to now perform and do the things that make you rich. You don't need nothing, do you? What do you need? What do you need that you don't have? What is it? Right? And you're a Christian. I wonder how that worked out. I wonder where that blessing come from. You want more? I ain't never found a way to feel closer to God than serving God. Everything that you do, whether it is reading your Bible, praying for someone, or visiting someone, helping somebody out, giving your money to somebody, helping somebody in that way, there ain't a better feeling in the world. Because in that moment, when you're doing that, you're obedient to your Creator. Now, I've told you today how to be poor. Which is do nothing. And you can expect nothing. But if you want, then work for it. Simple as that. You want a car? Go get a job and work for it. You know, you want a house, get a job and work for it. If you want treasures that are going to last forever, you got to go out and work for it. You know? These souls ain't just going to save themselves. 
us. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is going to save us. But he will let us be there when it happens. And it's pretty cool when somebody does make a decision and you get to see that. Or when somebody is motivated by your diligence. Can you imagine this, Robert, when you go to a company and you take a standard with you that is God's and you change the whole company? It can happen. Why can't it? Hmm? I am excited about what is next. Y'all, there's so many things cooking right now that the stove is overloaded. It's overloaded. I'm telling you, it's stuff cooking. I'm very excited about it. See, I've been communing with the Lord in a very personal way, and we've been talking, and especially with, since started doing this study on in Proverbs, God has taken taken and helped me to see things in 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 a in a deeper way now, and. Oh man, the, the woo, what was this? I can't even say. I just can't even talk. There's so much going on that is about to just pop off. I feel the Holy Spirit close to coming, and and a lot of times I'm like Jesus coming back, and I feel like we're in the last days. I'm getting excited about it. Hey, you might not get to graduate high school, but too bad, right? Yeah, because we're going to heaven. It's going to be also. I just can't. look. It may still be 50 years. It, you know, that, that, that'd be all right too. But whenever it's going to be, woo, it's coming. I, can't, I don't even know what to say. It's just, you know. When we finally get to see Christ with our face, with our eyes, we sang the song, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. The countryest song ever. But when we see him with our eyes, this is, this is what I want to leave you with here. The Holy Spirit told me this week, when you see me with your eyes, will you be pleased with what you've done? Because there won't be another moment that you can do anything else for Christ after that. At the moment when you see Him with your eyes, will you be satisfied with how you've worked for the Lord? And I'm like, I just can't say, yes, I can't. I can't. Because I know that there's more I could do. I know that there's things that I can do better. I know that there's things that I could, I, I could put a little bit more passion in and, and be a little bit more devoted to. I mean, we've all got room that we can improve, right? Now, if we really have diligence in our, in our character and integrity in our character, then, then we're going to want to do those extra things that are necessary, that are going to bring God glory and bring people closer to Him and bring us closer to Him and bring the Holy Spirit down into our church. And all of a sudden we're going to start seeing miracles happen and people changed and saved and, and unity happen. Or we could just not have anything. And we know how to do that too. You don't want nothing, don't do nothing. If you want the peace and the blessings of God, surrender to Him and live for Him. You will be rich. That's what God sent me in here to tell you. If there is something in your life that is keeping you from being diligent, keeping you from having integrity, repent of that sin today and let God change you.